Hi, friends. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I think something beautiful has, has begun, and I want to tell you about it. Uh, advocates uh, for racial justice and for environmental protection are beginning to come together uh, in new ways. What these efforts have in common is an advocacy for deeper change beyond what is commonly associated with traditional civil rights and environmental movements. These new efforts at green-black fusion are grounded on a strong foundation. When one explores the roots of both the environmental movement and the civil rights movement, one finds a radical critique in both cases. Moreover, these critiques are strikingly similar. Both have called for a deep restructuring of society and economy. And in both cases, that call rests on an affirmation of life in all its fullness and of the devoted care that life requires of us. In both communities of color and environmentalist, we have had to struggle against a cluster of long-standing cultural prejudices and misguided values. These habits of thought have encouraged the subjugation and exploitation of both non-human life and certain human groups, typically relegating these human groups to a less than fully human status. So let's start with the environmentalist. They must confront a haunting paradox. Our environmental organizations have grown stronger and more sophisticated and better funded, winning many battles along the way. Yet here we are 50 years after the first Earth Day and we find ourselves on the cusp of a ruined planet. Imagine. Clearly, it's time for a new environmentalism, pastime. One can begin by asking, what is an environmental issue? I'd say that an environmental issue is any issue that affects environmental performance. When answered that way, environmental issues must include our failing political system the pervasive economic insecurity that paralyzes political action, and the materialistic, racially divisive, and completely anthropocentric values that tend to dominate our culture. Environmental degradation is also driven by a triple imperative. GDP growth at almost any cost, ever enlarging corporate profit, and runaway consumerism. These are among the underlying root causes of our environmental decline. They are also essential features of our political economy. If American environmentalists ever hope to succeed, and we do, we must find ways to address these systemic issues, which to date our movement has largely ignored. In the environmental movement's early days in the 1960s and early 1970s, those at the forefront asserted the need for radical restructuring of our economy and indeed our society. Environmentalists must revive our legacy of radical critique. As the expression goes, system change, not climate change. As in the environmental world, a great many in the black community are seeing limits to traditional advocacy. Achieving equal rights has enabled a modest black upper middle class to prosper, but it hasn't prevented the deep problems that are still afflicting blacks and other communities of color. Faced with this realization, a number of black leaders from grassroots movements such as Black Lives Matter and the Poor People's Campaign to scholars are all calling for the rediscovery and revitalization of the radical roots of the civil rights movement in order to address the deeper structural issues facing minority communities in America. Martin Luther King Jr. turned increasingly to these broader issues in his later years. In 1967, the year before he was shot, he called on his followers to honestly face the fact 
that the movement must address itself to the question of restructuring the whole of American society. There are 40 million poor people here, he said, and one day we must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? And when you begin to ask that question, you're raising a question about the economic system, about the broader distribution of wealth. And when you ask that question, you're beginning to question the capitalistic economy. We are called upon, King said, to help the discouraged beggars in life's marketplace. But one day we must come to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. If we review the radicalism that can be found in the early years of both the environmental and the civil rights movements, their shared roots are apparent. The best traditions of both movements are very much aligned. Both see the origin of our country's problems in the socioeconomic system as a whole and in the values and institutions that support it. Simply put, the operating system in which we live and work is programmed for the wrong results. It needs to be reprogrammed so that it genuinely sustains human and natural communities. The task is daunting, but rich with opportunity. In short, this black-green fusion is a powerful basis for dialogue and collaboration between two of our country's greatest social movements. It holds the potential for a common language, a common critique, and a common agenda. But there is an even deeper and more profound set of considerations that unite black and green. King called for a radical revolution in values. He spoke with clarity about what was at stake. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society, he said, to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. So the subjugation of nature and non-human life creates the model the pretext, if you will, for the subjugation of human beings. Human dignity cannot be restored without first displacing the exalted status that Western thought has bestowed upon some at the expense of others. Full dignity requires that humans be reconnected with each other and to the natural world that sustains all life. This attitude of control and dominion over soulless matter and animals, as well as inferior non-whites, is an evil embedded deeply in the culture of modern society. It also haunts and weakens our democracy. Unless we counter the white supremacist attitude of control and domination of both nature and non-white others, Building the cross-racial solidarity needed to deepen democracy, change the economy, and save the environment will continue to elude us. So how do we overcome our tragic legacy of subordination of nature to humans and of humans to other humans? Surely one step is to see this historical pattern for what it is, the product of pure arrogance while recovering the deeper sources of civil rights radicalism in unwavering belief in the equal dignity and moral worth of all human beings, we can also connect to the deeper sources of environmental radicalism, restoring the connections between human beings and the natural world. Their common love and care respect. These we owe both to each other and to the natural world. 
Their common wellspring is an attitude of the heart, an abiding humility and awe and reverence in the face of life's wondrous creations. And that's the very opposite of arrogance. Thank you. I appreciate this opportunity. I thank uh, Reverend Tom Kinder for it. And I also thank Phil Thompson at MIT for his help uh, with this. Bye-bye.